Again, so thank you very much for inviting. And I look at this schedule I, and I thought, okay, well, in my mind, I'm still like a student and I want to be in the classroom instead of giving a lecture because th there are so many things to learn. Uh, and, and, and it's really fascinating. And I wish we had this kind of thing in my time, like 10 years, 15 years ago. Everything you learn from your advisor or from your friends and this and that. So that's great. Uh, okay. So. Uh, as you, as you judge by the topic of uh, my talk, I'm going to be talking about the uh, uh, the quantum materials, but in a very special sort of subset uh, called the uh, thin films, right? Uh, and that's what basically my specialty. Uh, I, I sort of kind of uh, wear two hats, um, and not sort of kind of. Uh, by my training, I'm a spectroscopist, but when I become a the postdoc, uh, I, I, I learned how to grow uh, thin films, and when I got my, my, my job, I, I decided that I'll just carry on with two hats, and, and it's actually just highly recommended. It works really well. So you can be doing your own physics on your own materials. So it's like uh, a lot of fun. Okay, so um, that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is the lecture, so everything is like down to earth, uh, very simple. If you know many things, don't worry about that, just skip it. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't collect to the end, just raise your hand and I'll try to address, you know, as, as long as it's not a long uh, answer. Okay, so I'm going to be talking like what's the quantum materials uh, from what, the way I see everything here, by the way, is very personal. If you disagree entirely, it's great. Uh, everybody delivers sort of like personal point of view, personal experience, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, and uh, I want to say that that's what I see, what knobs we have for creating quantum materials. And I want to just uh, push the things a little bit further and say two, th two words about that the films, uh, thin films, is not the end. Uh, I, I borrowed this term from a uh, famous theorist from Santa Barbara, uh, Leon Balanz. He introduced a new word which I really like. It's called the ultra quantum matter. Um, and uh, so that's perhaps what's the most interesting thing in my view is happening pretty soon. Uh, then I'll talk about very practical thing for people, you know, you're here to learn about the films, so that's what it is. It's a nitty gritty details about the, you know, what's the quantum designer's to, uh, toolkit, so what can you do with the films, okay? And I'm sure I will stop somewhere here, <laughs> but <laughs> let's try to see how far I will go. Okay, so this is my group, and what I'm going to be saying is really a lot of what, what they do. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to send me email um, in this address, and, and my, my website is super super simple. I just was surprised nobody steal this this word. So I'm a quantum at Rutgers.edu. So that's right, you know. But somebody stole the MBE, so I couldn't do that. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so if you want to read something, I put, again, it's a, it's a personal perspective. There are like millions of books, and, and it's like doing the world literature in one hour lecture, okay? So this is like impossible, right? So what I'm going to do is like, please have a look at the things I'm going to be talking about. They're really well described. And those two papers are particularly useful. Then uh, one is called The Emergent Properties in the Plain View, where we sort of uh, myself and my colleagues, we put some, some sort of personal view what's happening with the thin films uh, back to night to some and then we introduced a new idea, how can you design the quantum uh, states by using geometric lattice engineering. Again, it's a review, it's not a scientific paper, it's a review where we put some ideas about that. And then we apply all these ideas to basically to, to, to flourish the field of uh, rare earth nickel, it's become now popular since this topic of the uh, school is superconductivity. The superconductivity nickelates is a popular topic now and I'm pretty sure it will be at APS March meeting uh, prominently. Uh, described, but you can read a lot about that in this uh, review. Okay, um, so uh, what are quantum materials? Again, <clears throat> I'll give you my own definition of that, but b before you understand what the definition is, I want to put some scale for you or some sort of view uh, of emergent phenomena. You heard a lot about emergent phenomena, but I want to illustrate it. So, uh, what I want to put here is a multiplier for the number of compounds, okay, in my um, uh, uh, 
you know, in some database in a table, and then uh, I'll scale it with the number of atoms in this compound. So, and then we'll see what can I get. It's sort of the illustration of what's happening. So, if you have a hydrogen atom in the domain of atomic physics, uh, I'm not sure, and I, unless you study metallic hydrogen, I don't see for condensed matter uh, physics to be anything interesting in there. Um, but, uh, so it's uh, in the powers of hundreds in the power of zero, so it's, uh, there is only one compound, it's the hydrogen itself. But then I go to the single uh, uh, material, so like niobium for the condense, and you can already get in the condensed phase about 100 compounds, and we get in the periodic table, and we got like superconductivity of BCS type. It's already a great phenomenon by itself. Of course, you can get metallicity and other collective things. Um, you go to the binary compounds, and they're about uh, 100 to the power 2, so it's 10,000. And you can get immediately something really spectacular. You can get skirmions and fractional quantum Hall effect. Just basically increasing the number. It's in the binary. You cannot get anything like this here. Keep going, and then and you put three, you could get uranium alloys, you know, that's your domain of heavy fermions, you get this like crazy phenomenon like it's called schizophrenia of electrons, spin and charge separation. Uh, you can got condo physics and other interesting things you could study here. So, if you keep increasing that, we're in the domain of uh, absolutely unknown. We still don't understand how this thing works microscopically. We know everything about this material. So those are cuprates, high temperature superconductors. And uh, again, uh, we just explored one or two or hundreds, but look at the, how many of these compounds can you find. And you keep going. It's just four elements in this, yttrium, barium, copper, and oxygen. So, what it shows to us in the solid state physics, once you increase the number of elements inside, the complexity merges. It's not like basically you scale it with the number of compounds. The very physics, the intrinsics, all of a sudden they just start popping up, which you cannot find in the lower sort of number of uh, uh, elements in the material. So that's my illustration of emergent phenomena. Now, what is the quantum material then? Uh, I made this joke long ago in my class. I said, uh, if you find any material which is non-quantum, let me know. I'm going to get a Nobel Prize, okay? Uh, because we clearly know that the Schrodinger equation will govern any material. It doesn't matter what, how you call it, okay? It is a quantum material. But this is my definition of that because my colleagues keep asking, why, what's this crazy thing about quantum? This is the definition I want to put here. It says, the materials and structure where many body quantum mechanics is the main reason for emergent properties. Okay, this is the key, emergent properties and many body. Okay, so with this definition, uh, I'd like to show that this is my view of the current uh, uh, world of uh, quantum materials. So we have our benchmark, it's a beautiful thing, it's a called bulk crystals. Uh, that's where you uh, basically practice and try to understand intricacies of intrinsic working of these materials from the quantum many-body point of view. And as you see, my boxes, they overlap. Everything here is the overlaps. The new things which Dave uh, uh, will be talking after I finish uh, is this in the world of the 2D, 2D crystal. Again, it's today's view, right? Where the uh, very interesting phenomena occurs, you got uh, tightly correlated electrons, typically D electrons, and you just dilute them by, by, by using some anions, which was the chalcogens, right? And you become much more covalent, so they give you much more um, uh, 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 degrees of freedom for this kind of materials to move, and it opens the new physics because now you can make them very planar uh, by coupling through the Van der Waals force. Um, these materials are fantastic because there's a new kind of lattices you can have, new kind of interactions, and I call them natural super lattices because you can basically just use and use doing what uh, scotch tape physics if you wish to. How far can you go? Who knows? You know, it depends what, what you're doing. But, you know, graphene, if I ask you what's a graphene, is it thin film or it's a crystal, you would be surprisingly saying, I don't know. Okay, so that's the world we are. And then you can go further. Of course, you can say, okay, why do I grow this crystal? Maybe I could make a film out of that myself. Okay, well, you can do things. There is no big difference between this and that. And here we're in the domain of thin films and hair structures. So what differentiates this from that? Um, not much, perhaps, but here I have my, a little bit more control. Okay, and uh, you can view these materials as a standalone films if you wish to, because every film will require substrate. I need to have something to grow on. 
eventually. Okay? And that's what brings something new here. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. I want to say something uh, where this whole world is going. In my view, the new things will start popping out. If we go to these uh, structures, they will call, uh, really don't know what they are. They're really the structures and hard to call them um, films because they're basically made of entirely of interfaces or entirely of one single layer and so on and so forth. Uh, I call them ultra thin structures or some road to the ultra quantum matter. So what can you get out of this? Um, in these things you can get uh, in the quantum materials, we know this is the physics we studied for the past 30 years. Uh, we got a whole bunch of order and phenomena and strong correlations. That's the domain we, we hear. Heavy fermions, frustrated lattices and interactions. Uh, very, very hot topic uh, been, you know, for the past several, maybe five, seven years of flat band materials. Uh, people believe the instabilities in these flat bands because you have to think, what is a flat band? Flat band, it means that your electron stopped. The electron is a wave. How can it stop? So that's the things. Uh, when I say flat band, you immediately should translate that something is wrong. So there will be some kind of instability in the system which will trigger and people say there will be some crazy room temperature superconductivity, for example, this and that. Um, there are, of course, exotic superconductors, so topological superconductors, JP has just put quite a bit of effort studying this kind of things. Um, the, the other domain, you know, you can switch here, and it's uh, very much been uh, sort of in the focus of the community in the 2D crystals and the, and, all, and the heterostructures, where you start looking at the topological heat and charge transport, okay? Um, where you can look at this all sorts of interesting phenomena as like anomalous whole states, spin whole states, quantum, uh, quantized versions of that. Um, of course, uh, you know, the world uh, become a little bit crazy once we... Uh, uh, discovered that we have uh, edge states and materials uh, which are quite interesting, unusual. They have um, uh, direct like dispersion, uh, so we call them topological insulators, for example. Uh, there is another class of uh, materials which I find personally very, very interesting. Uh, it's called uh, semi-metals, um, and uh, if, if the electrons there also have this interesting behavior uh, with the direct or wild like semi-metals, called direct or wild metals, um, that's it. again, you can find them here. And uh, why, why I think this area is, is going to be a sort of some of importance? Because what are we going to do now? We're going to combine uh, the strong correlations uh, with this kind of electrons. And uh, the idea, at least uh, there are one trillion theory papers, is to produce the states of matter which are totally insane, uh, where the electrons, uh, like you know, photons or like what people do these day, days in qubits, somehow. Uh, you know, you think that 10 qubits or 100 qubits is a big deal, then think about the quantum spin liquid, okay? You get 10 to the 23 electrons and they're all entangled, okay? That's a massively entangled state um, and, and that's a, 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 do they exist? We don't know. We have no idea. Um, but uh, this is the hope to move to the domain to see what happens when you just combine strong correlations uh, with the topological properties and, and instead of like symmetry breaking, you got the new kinds of order, which is called topological orders. Um, and, and, and that becomes very interesting. So it's basically the merging of the main as the mathematics we inherited from astrophysics most of the time and string theory projected into the uh, domain of condensed matter physics. This is really the emergent. It's a, it's a frontier, it's a wild zone, you know, like there are no rules, there are no well-classified things, everything is for grabs, okay? Okay, so enough, done. Uh, that's what's the, the way I view it. Uh, there are more of that. Now, so what do we want to do with the films? The films, uh, I like this cover from Scientific American. Um, I, I don't like when people say we want to design our materials, we want to tailor made materials. I think we don't want materials. What we want is really the phenomena. We really all fascinated not by the materials itself, but the phenomena we can find in that. So I, I propose that we just refocus and say from randomly discovered phenomena by intuition, by luck most of the time, to we want to move to some quantum collective phenomena by design. Is that possible? Uh, at this stage perhaps not. Okay. But there are tools and I want to show it to you that we can try it. Uh, okay, so what is the 
What's the foundation of uh, thin films and particular heterostructures? Why do we care? Um, you, you can say many things, but in reality, that's what I learned from one of the prominent Japanese uh, scientists, uh, Yoshi Takura. Uh, he, he published several years ago a nature kind of review uh, in nature materials where he started things quite right. He said, look, if you look at any of your films, by the nature of the film, you have a surface and you have the interface to your substrate. That's the place you immediately just move across and you see the symmetry is broken. So once you break this symmetry, this translation the symmetry is broken, then you can expect something. Because, uh, and I will see why. This is basically here in the box, why? Okay, this is the uh, Landa rule. So, and then you can continue on. There are all sorts of things you can break in the interface I'm going to show to you. So all sorts of symmetries are broken. But we know from Landau, this is really one in his textbooks, it said the sudden disappearance of the elements of a symmetry, one or many, in one phase leads to the occurrence of a phase transition to a new phase with the lower symmetry typically. Okay, this is the very powerful symmetry argument. In the universe we have only two things. Okay, the conservation of something and the symmetry. If you just within the domain of two, those two, everything is possible. Okay, okay, that's the most important thing. This this is the instrument. So if we could control the symmetry breaking process, we can start controlling basically the phases. Okay, this is what the designer paradigm. That's why the films are, uh, in my view. It's, or it's a view of uh, Takura uh, um, paper where he proposed this idea that the films are really uniquely positioned for symmetry break and control. Okay, so um, let me show to you now where, where things become interesting. So this is your uh, crystal. So what we try to do, we'll try to take my, our crystal, randomly dump with element A into the B matrix or some more complex versions of that and I hope the new emergent properties will appear. We can do the same thing, of course, in some ordered way because you can say, okay, well, I have to distribute this material like this. Maybe I could put some matrix like that, right, and hope that this if you call this a foreign atom, it will be just nicely laid out here and I can study physics in a much more sort of uh, ordered way. So you could think about this like ordered uh, version of that. Or you can go, and that's what I called, oh, uh, sorry, okay, uh, the ultimate version. This is not equivalent of any of those. This is the ultimate limit. A limit. Why? Because position your eye anywhere. If you put your eye here, or there, or there, there is no bulk-like unit cell. Even with three mono layers, you still have a bulk unit cell. But in this version, there is no more bulk-like unit cell. This is entirely new material. So if you have absolute control on this kind of layering, you can create your new material just basically on demand. Okay, and of course, then in this version, every possible symmetry will be broken. I'm going to uh, illustrate this um, uh, with the sort of work we've been uh, doing for quite a while and become very good up to this really that kind of level of control. So we tried to merge uh, wine temperature superconductors uh, with the ferromagnets. And again, if you look carefully, you could say, okay, well, uh, so you can do it. Ferromagnet with superconductor is an idiotic thing because uh, certainly the ordered parameters, they're so incompatible because uh, one thing will go in some kind of versus Cooper pairing, right? Uh, which is spins trying to orient it a certain way. It's a D wave, but like in even a singlet sort of like first, simplest version, it's going to be like this. Uh, and the ferromagnet is always a triplet or kind of version of a triplet. So you need some uncompensated magnetic moment to be locked in in a single phase. That's the ferromagnet. Um, so if you bring them together, how did it work? Well, you can say, okay, if you look at the energies, you know, the energetics, the J for the coupling for ferromagnet is much stronger. So it's a stupid idea. You just squash your ferromagnet and it's nothing like that. That was the conventional thinking that before we done it and when we done it, we discovered that actually super high temperature superconductor can be made ferromagnetic. Okay. Um, and so this is what happens at the interface. So the interface between those two is a very interesting thing because this is your ferromagnet and this is superconductor. There are orbital order here and orbital order there. How do they coexist? 
it's like this. Then there is a magnetic order in this layer versus that layer. Again, how did it coexist here? The interesting thing related to the charge, if you start counting charge per atomic plane, you go plus, minus, plus, minus, and then you get to this interface, and then you get huge change in the charge, so there is a polar jump. Very large polar jump across interface. Then, if you have a polar jump, you have an electric field, and the atoms start moving, and the bands start moving. And of course, the it's, it's actually elemental map that, uh, done by David Miller in my film. Uh, if you can look at that, every color here is a new chemical material, a chemical element. You can see, even by chemistry, it's a very foreign environment uh, for these atoms at the interface. Okay. So all this, all of a sudden, start playing the role and start rearranging, reorganizing, and give you like a new material all of a sudden pops out. Okay? This is what I'm saying. That of course, you have to make it as thin as possible, right? So this is, those are monolayers, but ideally, you want to just shrink it down, shrink it down here, and see what you got. Okay. Um, now, that's about the creation of material. What about the control? The bulk crystals are beautiful because that's, we, we have so many fantastic tools, and again, uh, my, my uh, bulk crystal uh, growers, uh, colleagues should forgive me, I just list what I, I, I know. Uh, so you can adopt this crystal, you can apply pressure, you can apply magnetic field, uh, you can create all sorts of polymorphs, uh, trying to see the same chemical composition, different lattices, how they behave. Um, uh, but that's about it. Uh, that's about as much as control I know of. Maybe JP knows more. Uh, there is more to things to do with that. But that's what most of people will do. Uh, with the films, you have this, uh, but you can extend it uh, by saying that, well, uh, so we have uh, uh, doping, but uh, you know, we can do a char a charge transfer across the interface, two interfaces, get different chemical potentials, they will equalize, so the charge will move. Usual thing, it's PN junction, like in semiconductors. Uh, you can do electrostatic gating, so you can apply some, uh, some kind of uh, um, gate, uh, and uh, you all have phones, so they work. That's a transistor, so. Um, then you can uh, use the strain, uh, strain is not pressure, but kind of, you know, sort of gives you some ideas. We can, of course, do magnetic field, but there are more. So, and this is what I find most interesting. So, you, we can design our lattices. In other words, this bulk material is bulk because it doesn't know about its orientation. In other words, if you take a crystal and rotate in space, the properties will be invariant. Okay? This guy really knows how it's oriented because it's on the substrate and the surface is a well-defined cut, it's a well-defined uh, surface plane and when the crystal grows it knows really well in what direction it grows. In other words, rotating like this doesn't do anything, it's still oriented crystal. That's a huge difference. So we can impose the lattice symmetry here. Uh, then I can squeeze it to the few monolayers. You can, you can argue you can do in a 2D, uh, 2D materials, sure. Yeah, uh, it's like, as I said, the same boundary condition. It's a natural super lattice to me. And of course you have the interfaces, which is a really beautiful thing. But of course, you know, many crystals have internal interfaces too. So it's, it's kind of like a lot of cross-talking between the fields. All right. And now here's my answer. Why, Jack, you're not doing that and why every three days you're not producing this fantastic new material because since you know what to do. And this is my answer to you. Uh, again, it's all personal. You may, you know, my colleagues may disagree. But this is why I say why creating new materials is so, so hard. It's a bit wordy. You can read it. Uh, my major point is the growth phenomena are still poorly understood on the atomic scale. We can mumble as much as you wish to. You can go to your favorite DFT person, try to do it, but DFT is a T equals zero. Okay, you need more powerful methods, you need to use Monte Carlo and this and that, and that's very expensive, very computationally. Um, so what we know of is uh, it's, it's mostly phenomenology. So it means that it's when you grow the material, a lot of intuition goes into the, the growth of the material or experience, and I call this modern day alchemy. Because if somebody tells me that I know it is because of my experience, to me it's like alchemy, nothing else. So the second thing, the atomic theory of nucleation and growth does not exist. 
Okay, we have a lot of thermodynamic mean fields stories about that. But if you go and say, okay, I have ABC material, just real material, can you just do the calculation for me for that specific real material? People say, no, 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 it's a joke, you know, it's too much. Uh, and as such, you can't just predict, otherwise we will just do these materials by design, pick from the periodic table, boom, and it gives you the properties of the, you know, material. Um, and then unlike the feasible, because again, it's a computationally crazy problem to do it on atomic scale. Uh, and as a result, non-trivial new materials uh, requires months, seriously months. And I know the cases where people spend years of this kind of alchemy. Okay, and uh, often based on the experience, and you would be sort of surprised, but actually a lot of people work, look, I worked for many years on doing superconductivity nickelates, and Harold Huang did it, I didn't, right? So it means you need this. You need a little bit of luck as well. So it, uh, it's, it's always like that, you know, and then it's beautiful. So it gives the, you know, it's a field for everybody to play. Uh, so. That's, that's what I like. Uh, and that's what I call this, why is it so hard? So now, going to the designer's toolkit. Let's go to some very important things. If after my talk, you would not remember anything, seriously, you just say, okay, I, it was early morning and you speak too fast, um, then uh, just try to remember this, okay? Uh, and that would be really great for me. Um, so. I would like to ask this question, and I keep poking every person who pops, shows up in my group, and it's a really great example, the next slide you'll see. Why do fields grow actually at all? And let me show it to you, there is a huge paradox to that. Uh, this is my paradox, and I really love this example. This is europium nickelate, idiotic simple perovskite, simplest things you can do. Cubic, oh, okay, it's not cubic, but okay, it's very simple material. Three elements in there. Uh, you go to your single crystal grower and say, can I get a crystal, single crystal? They say no. Uh, why? Because it's hard, it needs this temperature, it needs this pressure, and the crystals will give you 50 micron in size, okay? See the numbers? I just highlighted them. Okay, uh, you come to me and say, Jack, I'd like to get this. I say, no problem. Um, come in six, seven hours, I'll give it to you one. Uh, this, I will give you, I will grow in the six and seven hundred C. And this pressure, of oxygen, and I will give you this crystal in this size. Actually, single crystal. Single domain, by the way, if somebody would just wonder. You say, no, no, wait, wait a second. That, it should really get the kick out of that. If I now go to the standard tables where you have europium, and I have nickel, and I have oxygen, and I look at this beautiful triangle, and I put this condition in there, it's gonna be a mile away. It doesn't exist on that triangle. That phase should not be there at all, okay? So, and I keep, keep going that, in fact, this is almost guaranteed the standard condition for most of oxides we grow in, in our MBE chambers and PLD chambers. I can go, and sputtering is similar, it's a thing. I can go to chalcogenides, it will be very similar. So you'll be shocked, say, oh wait a second, why they're so far away, they outside of any growth window for any bulk crystal, and yet they perfectly stabilize. We can go to every minute characterization and show this is absolutely the bulk-like material, okay? It's not some magical film, it is bulk-like material. How did it grow? And that's what I would like you to, to understand. If I say, if you understand nothing else, that's fine, okay? This is the only thing. How is it possible? Okay, this is how things grow from the vapor phase as any physical methods, liquid or vapor, they all very, very similar. So basically, uh, this is just a standard slide. You can go into any textbook, any crystal grower will say it's a very similar thing. But you have, uh, uh, surface, uh, you got some uh, vapor or some gas phase or liquid phase popping out here, so you deliver some atoms. You need some, um, uh, some temperature here, so diffusion will start moving them. Then sometimes they will create cluster. If the cluster is a critical size, so it will just start nucleation of a new phase, uh, some new nucleus, otherwise they will dissolve and start moving or dissolve like in the pump, you know, popped out, out of the chamber. Um, and uh, depending on the, on the dynamics, 
uh, how much material how you deliver here, the flux, and how much the temperature here, what's the pressure here of the vapor pressure over the surface. Uh, all these results either will grow islands because you know you put more and more and more and the more here, more there, and they, they just finally fill up the whole surface. And I'll give you like mountain like growth, terrible. Ugh. Okay, we don't want that. Or, you know, if you're lucky and, you, and your condition's so nice, you deliver really in the right amount of flux and they distribute it in the very right way over the surface, then it will just fill up one layer at a time. You know, it's like pouring water. You know, it's just one layer at a time. So that's a layer by layer growth. Okay, that's as much as, there are much more to that, you know, but that's sort of what I want you to know. Uh, okay, so our goal is this, because I can just grow mana layer by mana layer. So it's called 2D um, layer by layer growth. Okay, so now <laughs> formulas. Formulas are important. You know, we students tend to, to like, okay, give me a wave handling argument. I can give you many wave handling arguments, but sometimes it's important to know formulas. Okay, have a look at them once at least, okay? Um, so uh, let's start with this. Things grow. And uh, because of thermodynamics, it's thermodynamics controlled by the free Gibbs energy. Okay, so we try to minimize the things. Whatever minimizes the things uh, makes it grow. Uh, so if I start uh, uh, writing how we grow out of new phase on, on monocrystal, um, out of gas phase, then we'll get the volume. Gibbs energy here, so we get some, some nucleus, we got volume Gibbs energy, uh, which competes, of course, with the surface tension and the tension due to, this is the key. This is what you typically never see. Um, well, sometimes you could see in the single crystal growth, but um, this is critical for the films. It's a tension due to the apodexy to the substrate. This is the very interesting term, so we need to look at that. Um, and this is some units for you to, to remember. Uh, if you, you can go and try to sign, find some theoretical results, so you can plug here and actually do the real calculations. Um, the things which people call uh, typically this train, uh, the amount, uh, it's our lattice. I prefer lattice mismatch. It's basically a film versus substrate divided by that. That's your epsilon. Okay, that's that's important thing because it will enter. So it's like your mismatch between the the um, the new nucleus you created on the surface and the substrate lattice parameter. Again, very simplified version because you know it could be 2D. Okay, we need to take into account difference between A and B, but it's a very simplified. I assume it's a square lattice on the surface. And then uh, I would like you to, to understand, once you drop something, this gas or the liquid on the surface, the new phases will start developing, all possible new phases. Given the thermodynamic condition, the new phases will try to nucleate. Okay? Everything is possible. Okay? There is no guarantee that what you grow is the material you want to. Everything goes. Now, how nature selects what will appear eventually as a thin film? And the answer is here. Everything grows and you have, let's assume, one phase which you grow has a very, very nice match. That's nucleus, right? You create it. Has a very nice match in the bond length to the sub is your substrate bond lengths, right? Or the lattice parameters, if you wish to. Another one is not, and I called it coherent and incoherent. So this is the coherent phase, and it's lattice matched, and this one is incoherent, okay? So the difference between those two, you know, there are some differences here because uh, there is a surface tension energy here is very, very different, uh, but this is the key term uh, because it's basically, you start basically putting some lattice with a different size and squeezing and squashing and stretching it, that nucleus, into the different lattice on the substrate. And that gives you this contribution to the Gibbs energy. And of course, we got the Jung modulus and the Poisson ratio here. Uh, but the important thing, it's, square, uh, it's squared in terms of the epsilon. Whereas everything here else is linear. And this is incoherent. Of course, for the incoherent phase, you don't care about this term. Now, if I take the difference between the coherent and incoherent phases, because they will, they will try to develop simultaneously, and I will just divide by the size of the square lattice on the substrate, so it gives me the energy difference. This is what I'm going to get. This is the fundamental formula, which basically is saying that this difference in energy between coherent and incoherent phase double prime and prime, is in this term. H is the height of your film, okay? Uh, of course, these things will try to, uh, uh, try to make your life miserable, and these things will may, may, you know, stabilize the film, this term. Now, 
let's move to this. Um, so again, I reproduce these things. Uh, again, the difference here, uh, because the coherent phase, the Gibbs change in the Gibbs energy is very, very large, so it gives me the negative contribution, which is very nice. Uh, but this one, of course, uh, any surface tension will try to compete. So it, it increases here. And uh, the key here is that delta E, the change here, is squared in the lattice mismatch, whereas it's linear in everything else. As a result, uh, we have, uh, I can look at this formula and I say when incoherent phase, uh, so basically I try to minimize the things, it becomes equals to coherent, so basically one day I'll lose coherency to the uh, substrate and then it gives it the critical thickness of the film. What I see here is the following. So assume this term is zero. So they'll change in the volume uh, Gibbs energy for those two phases. Let's say it's similar. Okay, that's zero. The, what I can see here is the more surface tension between substrate and the new nucleus I get, this thing, the better it gets. Okay, but the more strain or more mismatch between the lattice uh, and the substrate I got, the worse it gets, and it's square. That basically kills me, and that, that gives me the finite thickness. So the more mismatch I got, the less uh, thickness I can get. So this is some calculations I've been doing for a, a simple rutile structures, and uh, for 1% strain, typically I could get out of this. It's very hard to get these numbers, uh, but uh, it's typically 5 to 20 nanometers, which is about right. Okay, so the point is, uh, is what stabilizes the film, right? It's the tension between the surface tension between substrate and the nucleus you just created. Okay? This is your contribution to the stabilization energy, which does not exist for the free or incoherent film. And that contribution is really, it doesn't matter, you can get these things from the pressure, you can get it from temperature in the bulk growth. Here, you can go so much outside of that uh, growth uh, window only because you got that extra energy coming from the coherent contribution to the Gibbs energy. It's, it's entirely different. It's not thermal, right? It's coming from the, that coherent term to the Gibbs energy. And that's what's called the epitaxial stabilization. So the thin films, when they coherently grown, they epitaxially stabilized. So there is no miracle if you calculate the energy itself, it will be absolutely equivalent what you will get when you grow bulk crystal. It's the same number. But for the bulk crystal, you have to really apply pressure. You really have to apply temperature to crank your contribution to the Gibbs energy. Whereas here, you don't want to do it and you cannot do it most of the time. But you take that little what you need to stabilize phase to bring to the same total energy Gibbs energy, for that coherency between substrate and the film. That's where it's the, why the films grow. There is no magic. They do, do, they, they, the Gibbs energy is the same number, but the source is different. Okay, makes sense? This is what's called the epitaxis. So, that's what it says. Growth of a single phase occurs under thermodynamic condition where a compound in the bulk is thermodynamically unstable. It's seemingly. But, as I told you, the pressure and the temperature is not what defi defines things here. Because let me, let me show to you what happens uh, in the crystal. To see, this is the crystal. Uh, here, I'm very, very close to the substrate. And here, we have the contribution to the Gibbs from the substrate, and I can grow here. However, here, the film lost its coherency. And it decomposes into exactly the phase which would I have at given temperature and pressure on the phase diagram. There is no coherent film growth for the bulk. You should have those two phases. And indeed, if there is no contribution to the Gibbs energy, the film indeed decomposes in two parts, as it should have been. I mean, not enough Gibbs. That, that's it. You got it. You, so basically, there is no magic. The thermodynamic phase diagram does work. You know, if you don't have this extra crank from the substrate, you will get exactly what the, the phase diagram tells you. Decomposed film. That's what you find it. So 
that's why we try to make films as coherent as possible because without that we cannot grow that we cannot crank temperature to 1500 C okay it's just simply not the the the, the right way to do it. you know there are many reasons I can say for that but um, Jack? yes uh, do I think about this as when, you know, yeah. he is at the deviation yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's only there. It's all occurred. Yeah. In comparison to all crystals, so for instance, if you're able to nucleate the crystal growth in some other way, sort of like a substrate, like a seed crystal. Yeah, yeah. That's that in the metal. If you if you take a seed crystal, drop in the metal, exactly the same process. Absolutely the same process. And what this thing does, it basically lowers the nucleation barrier. That extra into the Gibbs from the coherency lowers the, the nucleation barrier. That's it. There is nothing, as I say, people make a miracle of that. But if you look at the formula, it's exactly the same thing. And if you're not having that extra crank that you outside of the phase diagram, you're going to get this. And we see it again and again. So nature works. You know, there is no magic in thin films. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely correct. Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip on that. Um, this is, uh, um, hopefully you'll get. So, this is the, 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 the answer to your question. Why uh, the, the films grow? So, this is the rule. If two or more chemical phases compete during the nucleation, the phase with the lattice most coherent to the substrate wins. That's the simple rule, okay? So for you to memorize, and that's why the films grow. Okay, so now I have to just strategically decide in a few minutes what I'm going to show to you. I'm going to show you maybe a few things. Uh, the substrate is, is terribly important, so let's, let's start with that. Uh, number one, if you start with it, that's what we get from our friends who are doing the most beautiful single crystal. They will polish, they will do everything impossible, and they will give you this. They say it's very, very good single crystal. Then we are supposed to grow on that. You cannot grow atomically flat things on things like this. Okay? What we want is this. And that's what's called single termination. There's the whole business how to go from this to that. Again, you need to do a lot of what I call soft chemistry. So here you have to do a lot of chemistry to remove these layers and make the surface single terminate. Here as I'm showing the example, what we can do, we we'll take uh, strontium titanate for example, and we can create, again, this is the AFM image, you can see the scale, so every it's a single terrace, it's a single atomically terminated flat surface here. And the step here is the one unit cell. So basically one unit cell, another terrace, and one unit cell, another terrace. That's how we can grow this films. So this is substrate, that's the film grown on that substrate. So you see that's beautiful. And one step is a Fongström, it's a perovskite unit cell size. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip on that. Uh, uh, defects are very important. Okay, I'm showing to you, by the way, what happens to you when you go and treat your substrate with the chemistry, the, the photoluminescence of the substrate. This is what I'm showing to you. Uh, this is, we typically use, we use buffered, uh, buffered hydrofluoric acid. Um, and uh, uh, this is what happens to, uh, this is basically the signal is the number of defects you produce in a substrate before you grow. We develop very, very new method for doing that thing. Um, it's actually scaled uh, by one third, so it's much larger. So we can do that, but still, substrate is loaded with electronic defects, and there are many, many reasons. Now, um, I, I may show to you how the things grow, but maybe not here. Um, it's a real movie. Let me show it to you now how the growth occurs. Now, many people just would like to know. Uh, this is the technology now part. All the methods where people use for thin films, uh, uh, apart from, of course, CVD, uh, chemical vapor deposition, it's a very different process. Um, but uh, the physical vapor pressure always requires a source. So you have to have some kind of source, okay? Either you have, um, uh, you get some elements, you heat them up to something, and uh, you open the shutter and the atom thermally will just fly. Or you can use your material, use the laser, you know, the laser pulse gets absorbed and it evaporates on the surface and again there is a cumulative effect and the atoms will fly or the ions will fly. So you have to find some, or you can use the sputtering. So you take your, again, uh, source, uh, you, use the, you put some argon, you put RF and they start basically breaking your uh, 
uh, the material, and again, atoms would fly. So you need the source of your atoms. And the rest is the same. You have a single crystal, and they all get deposited, and you have to heat it up. Very, very simple, you know, idiotically simple, if you wish to. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I want to show to you like a little cartoon how it works in the version of uh, PLD, pulse laser deposition. Again, it's all the same. Uh, so what we have here is this laser shot. Uh, this is the source. Um, you shoot. Uh, there are two materials which like to grow A, B, some say super lattice. And what you need, unlike, uh, um, I don't know if I can pose it. Oh no, I cannot pose it. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, what also you need is some control. So many, uh, often people ask, how do you know you have a one unit cell grown? How do you know that you have a monolayer? This is how they know, watch this. So again, there's a source, material, this is my substrate. I have in situ DC electron gun, so those are electrons in the grazing accident, so they reflect it. They just reflect off the surface all the time. And now watch what's gonna happen. So again, this is my detector. Uh, this is the surface of the crystal I start with. It's a substrate. I see beautiful allow diffraction. And uh, I'm going to monitor the intensity of any bright spot. You just pick it up and monitor the intensity. Watch this. You shoot, uh, and the, uh, I'll let you watch and then I'll explain to you. Basically, that's what TM shows the layers, and this is the intensity of the spots. We just monitor the intensity of the diffracted spot. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you like in a second when it stops. Okay, so what you observed is this. Watch this. This is the substrate. You sh shoot your basically electrons and they produce low diffraction. You pick the spot, okay? And the surface of the crystal is beautiful, right? That's perfect. So the spot is very bright. Now I start growing. And what I monitor in the intensity is a function of time of that spot. So I start putting all this garbage. And so the atoms come in from the gas, right? What they do, it's like, it's like dust. You had beautiful, you know, mirror-like surface. Now you put dust and the, and the mirror gets dim. So the spot intensity goes down. Goes down. The more you put atom, you put, it goes down. Why? Because now you had beautiful surface, the single crystal, but you put these new atoms and they randomly sit in there. They produce a lot of diffuse scattering, so they're not going into this elastically scattered spot. So the intensity goes down. And they go down, 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 down. But once you covered 50% of the surface with the new material, then, you know, it's kind of like tricky situation. Do you have a new beautiful layer or you have old half covered layer. So you're on the bottom of the intensity. And you keep going, like 60% covered, 70% covered. It goes up, 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 100% covered with the new layer. Boom, it goes to the original layer. One wiggle, one mono layer. So simple. So basically what I do, I just keep pumping things. So I open my shutter, I do the pulses, or whatever technique you use for your source delivery. You just watch this thing going down, 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 boom, one. You want more? Three? Okay, keep walking. Two, three, boom, three man layer, stop. Okay, that's the, that's the thing. Okay, so I know like... Time scale? Huh? Yeah, what's the time scale for the green pattern? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the time for the, for the growth of a unit cell? Yes, yes, very, very good question. Yes, uh, uh, I, I'll show you the one real pattern like this. Okay, so you could see it. Okay, um, this is the real time scale. So uh, you can see, uh, this is the superconductor, bad growth here. You can see they, they die out. It means that you went three-dimensional growth. You know, uh, look, you, you just deliver too much, you know, they don't they distribute, they keep growing as a mountain, right? So you have one mountain, you keep reproducing mountains, basically. And as you can see, yeah, it's clearly, it's an AFM, you can see in the, in the scattering, it's a mountain. Uh, and the time scale, you can see, actually, this is quite substantial. So you grow one unit cell here, that was one unit cell, so let's say between 90 and the, so 10 seconds. So in 10 seconds, you grow one unit cell of YBC, it's 10 angstrom, so that's, you know, just basically the growth rate gives you, yeah. But uh, again, what this slide is about that, I, I highly encourage everybody, like, uh, invest time and effort in the new mode of growth. We discovered a new mode of growth, which we call the interrupted growth. It means grow as fast as you can. 
This is contrary to any everybody's like understanding. Grow your material as fast as possible. And this is what I show. This is the same material, absolutely the same, absolutely the same pressure, the same temperature. Everything is the same. The only thing I changed is how fast I deliver material on the surface. And you think if you deliver too fast, that will be really bad? Watch this. We deliver as fast as our laser allowed us to do. And then we get here. So you can even see here, we cannot even cannot see the wiggle, right? See, this is the wiggle. Every spike here is a wiggle. And in fact, you can see intensity increases, so it means that my, my film is better than the single crystal surface. I started that. And they look at this. It's a 70 picometer roughness. Beautiful films. So we discovered a new mode of growth. It's a highly non-kinetic growth. It's a really beautiful thing. But uh, so, so it's, we did it in 2011, so it was a very nice thing. So uh, it pays. Um, let, let, let me switch a little bit. I, I know uh, uh, there, there is a one topic. Uh, maybe you allow me three minutes? Oh, I should stop. Stay five minutes for questions. So okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I want to show you something which is very important. Uh, the polar mismatch. We, uh, I, I want to touch on something which you cannot find in crystals. That's, that's basically what it is. Uh, I put the word of warning here. The polar mismatch or avoided polar catastrophe. Uh, old story uh, first uh, propagated by uh, uh, groups uh, from Hel Huang and, and other Japanese groups were saying, you know guys, if your surface you try to grow is charge neutral and you put in the unit cells uh, which will have uh, charge plus minus plus minus. So you see this is the substrate and it's charge neutral. It's zero, zero, zero. Titanium is, is here four plus. Oxygen two minus. So the total charge is zero. Total charge zero. Total charge zero. So this is my substrate. Total charge zero. Now I'm growing this material. Very simple. Lanthanum aluminate. Lanthanum oxide, atomic plane, charge plus. Aluminum O2, charge minus. So what happens here? You see the thing? You start monitoring the potential. You put it on a neutral thing, atomically charged planes, there is distance between planes, you start growing potential. That potential grows to 50 EV within few unit cells. 50 electron volts within few unit cells. If you apply 50 electron volts on any band structure, imagine you have band structure, and you apply the potential of 50 electron volts, it's gonna shoot out the whole thing. So that was called the polar catastrophe because they say, how do we grow? It can't, it's not possible. You basically, the whole band structure, imagine yourself, you have beautiful parabolic bands and you put a linear potential of 50 electron volts growing. So how do we grow these things? And it was called the polar catastrophe. Um, and uh, I call it avoided polar catastrophe because we do grow these materials. So what happens then, uh, this is what we spent a lot of time looking at that. Uh, we disagreed with the interpretations and that's what we discovered. Basically nature is very clever. Uh, let me show it to you. This is a substrate and I grow one unit cell, two unit cells, three unit cells, and I start monitoring the crystal. What we found, nature compensates the things, basically introducing in secondary chemical phases, which will basically charge, compensate for the, uh, this uh, uncompensated charges sitting in there, in ideal configuration. So the result is you do have chemically, see, you can clearly see those are secondary phases. This is the secondary phase here. And only when you charge compensate with the secondary phase, you can grow beautiful single crystals, which you intend to grow like this. Okay, and uh, finally, grand finale. Uh, this is what I love a lot. That's what I work in these days quite a bit. How to design the materials. I want to show it to you what I'm really proud of. Uh, um, we introduced the concept of geometrical lattice engineering. It was sort of kind of obvious, even to Richard Feynman and back to his uh, lectures in 1963. That's why I stole it from. Uh, so how do we grow simple crystals, uh, super lattices? Um, in films, typically like this. So we layer them. So we put in the 001 stacking, there's atomic planes here, we stack them, uh, and we make super lattices. Uh, ah, all done, boring. What can we do if you, again, go to the Feynman's knots and look along the diagonal, you will see this. All of a sudden, you start seeing new stackings. This is one 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 oriented stack. This is another one. Uh, unit cell. So if I put another unit cell, two stacks. Does it remind you something? This triangular lattices all of a sudden start reminding you some interesting structure. So you can look at now 
your bulk crystals in the different orientations and use the substrate as a template growing in the 111, 110 or any kind of orientation you prefer and you get new materials. And this is the example. If I take this just perovskite, the cubic perovskite, and I layered it in a 111 orientation, but it has to be only two exactly union cells because there are two sublattice, it produces a perfect graphene. It's actually absolutely perfect graphene. The only difference, graphene bonds are in plane. Here the bonds, they go up, down, because there are two unit cells projected in long 111. And so we have bond up, down, up, down. But that's a hexagon. It's two unit cells of cubic material in 111. It's a buckle hexagon. Universally, you can now go and create any kinds of hexagonal lattices by doing this. And so we show that thing by taking this nodimium nucleate and doing this really two unit cells, doing graphene. And then this is just work was just published. We found we did first ARPES on this structure. That was a hell of work. But we did a real ARPES. We found real flat bands. We found real gapped states, you know, Dirac like. So it was a really beautiful work uh, done here. So you can really now engineer these things by doing what I call the correlated versions of your favorite materials, because these materials are abandoned, right? But graphene is so unique, right? And, and it's so hard to make these materials. And, and, and they will tell you in the next talk like how hard to make these high quality materials like this um, in the natural crystals. But in thin films, you can play a little bit of you know, this kind of game. Again, it's extremely hard too, because you're against polar problem. You have to grow in a very high symmetry directions. But it's a new direction you can do. So what we're working now, we're working on artificial Kagami lattice. It's really beautiful work you can do now these days. Um, so uh, this is kind of extensions of the ideas. So start looking at your favorite crystals, but in an oriented way. That, that gives you some new sort of approach to the material science, the quantum materials. And with that, I'd like to finish with my very favorite quote from uh, uh, one of the writers I really like a lot. Uh, I asked the question, is there an unseen universe hidden in the planar view? And this is my answer, yeah. Um, uh, the question, yeah, there is no question, it's unseen universe. The question is how far it's a meton, how far late it's open. <laughs> That's a real quote, I didn't make it up. Okay, with that, thank you very much. And sorry, I, I could have told you much more. Okay. <laughs>